Good evening, fellow classmates. Welcome to Classically Schooled on Twitch. And hello, class auditors from YouTube. Tonight, it is September 1st, as it has been all day, which means it is Septandy, that cliched little month of the year where YouTube creators from all over the world and possibly from outside this world, nah, just kidding there, <laughs> create videos dealing with Tandy computers. And I have an admission to make, I do not own a Tandy computer as much as I would like one. I never have owned a Tandy computer, I've only seen them. But I read a book as a child that had me imagine what it might be like to own a Tandy computer. And as you can see from my screen share, I have the book up for you to enjoy. In fact, if I could even, well, I don't know that I can make that go any fuller screen than it is, but I have a copy of the book, which I'm going to read from this copy of the book because I can see it better because there's stuff in the way of my second monitor. This is not the same copy of the book that I checked out from the library oh so many years ago. I wish I could get a copy of that book, but I'm sure the library has long since sold it off at a library sale and who knows where it went It because it had the, the cool library cover. I just have a generic one. A copy of the book that came from the Denver Public Library. I guess it is kind of interesting. I suppose I will, even though my table is a mess because I was soldering earlier in the week. But this copy, which I think I bought on Alibris, came from the Denver Public Library system although it is no longer the property of the Denver Public Library. But I find it cool. It appears as if at some point they did have a electronic checkout system because there was a barcode on the front of the book that's partially peeled off. But I do find it interesting. All of these due date stickers that apparently the Denver Public Library System put on the inside of the book. The Roanoke Valley Public Library System put them on the outside of the book on the plastic cover on the dust jacket so they could peel them off more easily. But I guess that does allow us the chance to see just how many times this book was checked out and the stickers are still here because it looks like there were some stickers peeled off at some point. But I see a due date of July 26, 1989. Looks like September 18th, 1990. January 4th, 1993. April 17th, 94. That one might actually be the, at least the latest time this was checked out and it got a due date sticker. I don't know, since I've never been to Denver, I, I don't know if they were still using this style sticker when they went to the electronic system. I think the Roanoke Valley Public Libraries did. But anyways, it looks like this book may have been checked out at least as late as April of 94. No, I, I unfortunately... Oh! Okay, there is an 87 date here under all these stickers, and it looks like this this sticker here might actually be 86. So it looks like this particular book was in the circulation possibly from 86, or this may even be a sticker maybe when they bought it. I don't know. Um, but this book... I do know, though, the Denver Public Library did buy this book June of 1984. But yes, 
Cross Alt. Basic programming for kids. Basic programming on personal computers by Apple, Atari, Commodore, Radio Shack, Texas Instruments, and Timex Sinclair. I do know that not all of the programs in this book, because this actually has example programs, I do know not all of the examples work on all of the computer models. I do believe the bulk of them work on the handy Radio Shack computer. But I don't know for sure. It's been a while since I've read the book. I don't have a Tandy computer to try them on. However, should anyone feel inclined to loan me a Tandy computer this month, I would be more than glad to do another live stream where we actually type some of these programs in. So I will keep my eyes peeled for the opportunity to even borrow a Tandy computer. But I am now going to go back to the screen share for the book because... It'll make it easier for me to read the book. If you would like to read along, I am going to have the book on the screen, although my, my head cam here might obscure part of it. But I do have a link in the description, or I tried to put a link in the description, of the link to archive.org where you could actually open the book and pull it up to read along. And if that does not work, or you don't see the link, you can also search archive.org for basic programming for kids. And at least as of a few minutes ago, it is the first link that will appear in the results. Just make sure you search the whole archive. Don't fall for the search box that's near the top of the page, which is just for websites. There's one a little lower down. You'll see pictures of books and music and whatnot. Search that. Basic programming for kids should be the first link. It says on archive.org, the note is it's for TI-99 4A computers, but it is for all six of these lines. Uh, I am only going to read the parts of Chapter 1 dealing with the Radio Shack computer because this is Septandy. And if you would rather, I invite you to close your eyes and imagine what it would have been like to be a child of the 80s and use a Tandy computer because that's what I had to do. I never, I don't think I've used a Tandy computer. Definitely didn't own one. Would love to borrow one. I don't even need to have it. Just borrow it. Anyways, I'm going to read along, but I will also read the dedication and acknowledgments and the introduction and then chapter one for Radio Shack. So this book is dedicated to Mick, Mike, and Ben. Acknowledgments. This book really owes its conception to C. Michael and Michael C. Alt. The first for providing the wherewithal and the second for discovering the why and wherefore. In other words, it was my husband who had the idea to buy a computer in the first place, and my son who was able to figure out what to do with it. This book couldn't have been written without their insights and collaboration. Special recognition also should go to Ben Alt for his program ideas, and to the Hardy School parents, teachers, and children for the support, encouragement, and enthusiasm that made this project possible. Former teacher Nancy Guveria, Guvia, Guvia des deserves special mention for pointing the way to an elementary computer program in our schools. Other valuable input came from Tom Vaughn and his teaching teamwork. Thanks to, to Frank Smith and Shelia and John Gill for their generous loan of their computers. Finally, 
I want to acknowledge the influence of Russ Walter in this book's approach to computing. For me, Russ's publications, The Secret Guide to Computers, 92 St. Holtoff Street, Boston, Massachusetts, 02116, were the first to cut through the jargon and obtrusiveness, obtruseness that usually obscure the subject, proving that computers can be easy and fun for just about anybody. Introduction. This is a book for children, parents, teachers, and anyone else who likes to learn. Its purpose is to help kids and adults to begin exploring an important and fascinating subject computers. A great deal has been said and written about the computer revolution. It is here and it is affecting all of our lives in ways we don't even know about yet. The younger you are, the more impact computers will have on you since you presumably have more years ahead to live in a world with more and more computers in it. Wow. How true that is. In order to use this book, you should have, or have access to, a computer that speaks the computer language basic. Every popular brand of general purpose microcomputer now being sold for homes and schools uses basic. This book will teach you how to write simple programs in basic for your computer. Its purpose, however, is not to make you a programmer. Its purpose is to help you understand computers, to think about how computers can help you in all kinds of ways, and to discover how much fun you can have when you learn how to talk computers. Here's where that old Chinese proverb, proverb holds true. Tell me and I forget. Show me and I remember. Let me do and I understand. In acquiring knowledge and confidence about using computers, there is no substitute for doing. That is, learning how to write your own programs. They don't have to be long, involved, or complicated programs. In fact, after you've done a bit of programming, you may find that it's not your thing and decide you'd rather just play computer games or maybe go roller skating or read a book. But once you've had that experience, your relation to the computer has changed. You no longer see it as a magical, mysterious machine you'd never think to question. And you'll be able to see more clearly why some programs work the way they do and perhaps consider how they might work better. The programs in these pages are only very simple examples of what you can do with a computer. But if you play around with them till you understand how they work, you'll have a pretty good foundation in communicating with a computer. If you then decide you want to learn more, there are plenty of other books and magazines to take you further. And as with learning any language, it's easier to become really fluent if you start when you're young. As you learn to make the computer work for you, you are gaining control over to something that's right up with the wheel. One of the most powerful tools human beings have ever created. Chapter 1. All Keyed Up. In this chapter, you will be learning about the keyboard on your computer. At the time this book is being written, the most common computers for homes and schools are Apple II Plus or 2E, Atari 400 or 800, Commodore VIC-20, 64, or PET, Texas Instruments, 99 4A. 
Hymex Sinclair 1000. TRS 80, model 1, 3, and color. If you have one of these computers, you'll find specific instructions for your machine in this book. But you should be able to use this book with just about any personal computer. The examples will work pretty much the same way on all types of machines. Just keep your manual handy in case you get stumped about which keys to press to make something happen. Before you can really start talking to your computer, you'll have to figure out how to get your messages out of your head and into the machine. Since your computer can't understand speech yet, You'll have to let your fingers do the talking. Or in computer jargon, you must learn to input information from the keyboard. The letters on all of these computer keyboards are just like the letters on a typewriter. But each computer has several special keys or combinations of keys that make it work in special ways. This chapter will explain how to use these keys to type words and numbers, and on some computers, pictures. It will show you how certain keys can make the computer do some fancy tricks. Once you know how to use the keys, then you can get started on learning the language. The most important key to using the computer, though, isn't on the keyboard. It's inside of you. Your ideas make the computer work. So anytime you have an idea, try it out. That's what your computer is for. It's a machine for you to think with. Explore, experiment, express yourself. And above all, have fun. Remember, there's no way you can hurt the computer by typing on it. This book is here to help you acquire a few skills you'll need to make your computer work for you. Use it only as a guide, a starting point for your own imagination. To begin, turn to the section that describes your computer's keyboard. The instructions you'll find there are your jumping off place for communicating with your computer. If you have a computer that is not one of the six listed above, turn to the practice section at the end of chapter one. When you can answer those questions for your computer, then go on to chapter two. TRS-80 Keyboard Step 1. Turn it on. Make sure everything is plugged in. Find the switch and flick it on. If your computer is attached to a separate TV set or monitor, turn on the TV. Turn the volume all the way down on the TV. You are ready to start typing when you see the word ready or on the color computer, OK, on the screen. If you don't see ready, press the Enter key until it appears. If you have a TRS-80 with a disk drive and you can't get the computer going, try this. Hold down the break key and press the orange reset key on the right side of the keyboard. Do this several times if necessary. You may also need to adjust the tuning on the TV screen with the controls under the left side of the keyboard. Step two, the cursor. Somewhere at the left side of the screen, you should see a little square or box, or on the Model 1, just a little line. This is called the cursor. The cursor 
shows you where your typing will appear on the screen. You should also see a prompt to the left of the cursor. It looks like a sideways V. Greater than sign. The prompt tells you when you're beginning a new line. Press the long key at the bottom of the keyboard. This is called the space bar. Notice how the space bar moves the cursor one space to the right every time you press it. Step 3. Fixing your mistakes. Typing letters on the computer keyboard is just like typing on a typewriter, but it's easier to correct your mistakes on the computer. Type your first name. Press the space bar. Then type your last name. Press the left arrow key. Notice how it moves the cursor back and erases the letters as it goes. Use this key to back up and make a correction when you make a mistake. Practice. Type this word. C-U-M-P-U-T-E-R. Do you see the spelling mistake? Back up the cursor and correct the word to spell C-O-M-P-U-T-E-R. Step 4. Confusing the computer. Type your name. Press the key marked Enter. What words appear on the screen? You should get the message SYN ERROR, which is an abbreviation for syntax error. That means that the computer does not understand you. Your name is not a word in the computer's language, in most cases. Pressing the Enter key means to the computer that you have just finished giving it some information. If the computer does not understand the information, it will give back the message syntax error, which means wrong word. An error message does not mean that you have to hurt the computer. It only means that the computer is confused. Step 5. Shift keys. Type the number 4 on the top row of keys. Now find a shift key. On most computers, there are two shift keys. You may use either one. Put one finger on a shift key. While you are holding down the shift key with one hand, type 4 again with the other hand. What happens on the screen? You should get a dollar sign. Keep holding the shift key and type the number 5. What appears? You should get a percentage sign. Can you explain what the shift key does when you type a number? What do you think you will get if you type the shift key and the number 8? Try it. Now type a whole line of letters. Then hold the shift and press the left arrow key. Notice how shift and the left arrow key combined erases the whole line. Step 6. Clearing the screen. You know how to erase letters on the screen one at a time with the left arrow key and how to erase a whole line at a time with shift and the left arrow. Now let's erase the whole screen at once. Here's how. First, type several lines of anything, then just press the clear key. Presto! It's all gone! Step 7. Letters and Numbers Type the letter O. It is between the I and P in the second row. Type 0. It is next to the 9 in the top row. 
Do you see the difference between the computer letter O and zero? It's important to remember that the computer makes a zero with a slash through it. Type the letter I, second row next to U. Type the letter L, third row next to K. Type the number one, top row next to two. Type the word oil. Type the number 1001. Look hard at these as they appear on the screen. Computers get very confused if you mix up your letters and numbers. So remember to keep them straight. Anytime you mean to type a number, it must be one of the keys in the top row. Or, if your computer has a special set of number keys like a calculator, those are okay too. Special Keys, TRS-80. The TRS-80 has four arrow keys, pointing left, right, up, and down. You're, you already, you've already seen how to use the left arrow key to erase one letter at a time and how to use the left arrow key with shift to erase a whole line at a time. Each of the other arrow keys does something a little different. Experiment with them so you understand how they work. Right arrow key. The right arrow key makes the cursor skip forward eight spaces. The right arrow key, when used with shift on models one and three, does something very unexpected. Try this. Type H-H-E-E-L-L-L-L-O-O. -O. Now hold the shift key and press the right arrow key. You should see a big H-E-L-L-O. Pressing shift and the right arrow key makes the letters twice as wide as normal. Anything you type now will appear in double size letters. But anything you've already typed will lose every other letter. To get back to normal size, press clear. The down arrow key. The down arrow key, as you might expect, makes the cursor skip down to the next line on the screen. The up arrow key. The left arrow key moves the cursor left. The right arrow key moves the cursor right. And the down arrow key moves the cursor down. But the up arrow key instead of doing what you might expect, does not move the cursor up. Instead, it prints something on the screen. Depending on which model TRS-80 you have, it may print an arrow pointing up, or it may print a square bracket. Actually, this is an exponent key. You use this when you want to type something like 10 to the third power. Math books sometimes write this as 10 with a superscript 3. On the computer, you type it as 10 up arrow 3. Shift and 0. One other combination of keys you should now know about is shift 0. On some models of the TRS-80, typing these two together will put you in lowercase mode. When that happens, every letter you type will come out as a small letter. If you want a capital letter, you have to use the shift key, just like a regular typewriter. To go back to normal, up to go back to normal uppercase mode, Press Shift-0 again. On the TRS-80 color computer, Shift-0 makes the letters on the screen go into reverse mode printing. 
instead of black on green, they become green on black. In reverse mode, the computer will not carry out your commands the way it does normally. So you should stick to the regular letters for writing your programs. Typing Shift-0 again will put the computer back into normal mode. If you are using a TRS-80, now skip to the practice section at the end of chapter one. Practice one. After you have completed chapter one, check yourself with these questions. One, what key or keys do you push to erase a letter you have just typed or to correct a mistake? Two, what is the cursor? Three, what do you type to get an exclamation point? Four, how do you clear the screen? That is, erase everything on the screen. Five, what does the long key at the bottom of the keyboard do? Six, what are the words that computer tells you when it doesn't understand you? Seven, how does the computer make a zero? Answers to practice one. The answer to question one is the left arrow key on the TRS-80. The answer to question two, the little box or other marker that shows where you're typing will appear on the screen. Answer to question three, on most computers, shift and one. Well, good thing we're not imagining using a Timex Sinclair computer. It has no exclamation point. How boring. All right, back to Tandy mode. Answer to question four. On the TRS-80, you push the clear button. Question five. It makes a space. The answer to question six. Syntax error, or the abbreviation, which on the TRS-80 would be SN error. The answer to question seven. O with a slash through it, or what we all know now as zero. Wow, that was a blast from the past. So how, how was your imagination using a TRS-80 computer? I know, probably not as good as actually having the real thing to use. But I guess it's probably possible to emulate a TRS-80 now, so maybe you can actually give it a try. I, I do, I did enjoy this book as a child. I, I know it has a lot of sample programs in it. I think my favorite program, which I'm going to skip ahead, my favorite program, I think, is the one that is on, oh, actually, oh, that's not it. Let me see what page it's on. Nice thing about having a paper copy of the book is, uh, yeah, I can jump to the page. I think it is page 131. All right. Oh, actually. That was pretty close. Is it? Mm. Nope, actually it is chapter 12, putting it all together. I think I really enjoyed this program because it was like a little interactive game. And fortunately, it does appear as if this program does work on the TRS-80. 
even though I know when I type these programs in, I had to use one of the classroom Apple II E's. But this program will actually work on the TRS-80. So if you want a fun little exercise and you want to go back down memory lane, check out chapter 12 in this book. You can type it in just like you would have in back then if you had a book or a magazine. I mean, sometimes those magazines or books would have a floppy disk. But in a lot of cases, the program was printed on the paper just like this. And, oh, that's actually the wrong program. It is in this chapter, though. Oh, here we go. No, it, it's the one on four. Uh, chapter 12, section four, politics. Yes, because it's a kind of a game you get to play. And, oh, yes, if you have a TRS-80, you'll need to look for the starred lines, and there's some substitute lines that are in the book for the TRS-80 for working with its version of BASIC. But yes, you can play this game. Don't worry. This was a book from the 80s, so in politics, you're just playing the the mayor of a town. And you get several problems and you have to solve them with your budget. And it's just a fun little game. Puts everything together. But there's some other examples in the, the end of the book you can type in too. So, yes. Just a fun book. I mean, maybe if you have the opportunity to check out a TRS-80 or Model 1 or Model 3 or a color computer. You could actually check this book out. It's on archive.org, so you don't have to worry about trying to find a paper copy because they're kind of hard to come by. I mean, I did not spend a lot for my printed copy of the book, but it wasn't. I guess it's one of those examples of a low supply, low demand book. So you might be able to pick a printed copy up fairly cheaply. But. Uh, you might not be able to. Anyway, it's a cool book. It kind of goes through some things. In fact, in the back of the book, there's a troubleshooting section that kind of gives you some troubleshooting tips for using the basic that's on your computer. And it's really cool how this book, it works for six brands of computers from back in the day, and it always breaks them out to tell you how to do it on your computer, so. <laughs> and yes, if you really want a blast from the past, you can check out Appendix 4. What is a computer? Because I'm sure if you're watching this now, you've probably figured out what a computer is, but Back in the day, this might have been your first experience with a computer, and this might have been the first time you actually sat down and read how a computer worked. So it, it's actually pretty cool. I mean, it actually, from what I remember, it actually goes into a, a decent detail, but it's not hard to explain. So I'm not going to read that part of the book. I really just wanted to read the first chapter of the book so that you could sit down and have a chance to close your eyes and imagine what it had been like to use a TRS, a Tandy Radio Shack computer from back in the day just to kind of kick Sep Tandy off. So I'd invite you to check out this book on archive.org. You don't have to even... Don't have to go to your local library. Although, I would really be interested to know if there's any libraries that have a copy of this book still on the shelf. Uh, does not count if you find a library that's been closed since 1990 and it like has books on the shelf that are dust-filled. That doesn't count. 
Oh, if there's an active library that still has a copy of this book on the shelf, that would be, I would find that hilarious. Uh, so leave it, leave a note in the comments if you actually see this book on the shelf of a library that you can actually check it out. In fact, actually maybe take a picture of it and post it to Instagram or something like that. I'd post a reply to your own post and tag me because I'd like to see it. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Uh, I, I doubt, though, there's any library that still has it on the book. Unless it's like the Library of Congress, maybe. So, that really was what I had for tonight's stream. I wanted to keep it one topic for Septandy. So, it was a short stream, but kind of a, a stream to do my the part that I could for Septandy because I own zero Tandy computers. I've never owned not even back then had a Tandy computer. I know the elementary school I went to had a couple sprinkled around, but none in our classroom. Our classroom had the, the Apple IIe and the Apple II GS and the uh, Macintosh LC, but no Tandy. So I typed the example programs in on an Apple, but I do remember, though, taking this book to school so that I could type the examples in when I got a chance to use the computer. but on the bus, having a long bus ride home, would read, read this book several times through just because it was a long bus ride. And I remember reading the, how you used all those computers to just kind of imagine what it would have been like to use a computer back in the day. So I hope maybe this might encourage you or maybe encourage you to explore the world of retro computing. Or maybe you you found a, a TRS-80 somewhere and you were wondering how to use it. And maybe this might get you started with the basic that's on it. Or just maybe read this book through and imagine what it would have been like to use the computer. So, and I guess one final note. I, I, I remember I wrote about this book on my blog, Computer As to Start. But Roz Alt. I don't know if you are still around somewhere, but if you are, I would like to thank you for the book you wrote. It did. I know it in helped many kids and adults get started with their personal computers. It got me started with the one that was in the classroom. So thank you for your contribution to computer education. And if I toast you with my virtual glass of tea, so, or if maybe you are one of Roz's children that are mentioned in the book, well, I thank you for your mother's contribution. And feel free to say hi in the comments if you, if you're there. So. Anyways, with that, I am going to call this stream to a close. So if you like, would like to see more of what I do with retro computers, click on subscribe on YouTube and hit the bell icon or give me a follow on Twitch. Or I encourage you to go search YouTube for Septandy. That's S-E-P-T-A-N-D-Y. I know as the month goes on, you will probably see videos uploaded on a periodic basis from many popular YouTube creators and possibly some new ones. And uh, you can see what they're doing with their Tandy computers, which span all the way from the microcomputers, the 8-bit microcomputers, all the way to Tandy actually made some personal computer clones. So there's a wide variety of Tandy computers out there. You can check out those great videos. So anyways, have a fun Septandy, and I hope to see you next time on my stream. So take care, and have a great evening.